of uh, the greatest news. Is it that you didn't go out in that romper? That's definitely not it. Ask anyone at my school. Okay, what I was saying mm -hmm. is that I got you an internship at the hospital! Oh. I mean, I had to give up my parking space, but I was like one patient death away from losing it anyway, so. You're amazing! Woo! Thanks, Molly! Hey. hey, everybody! I have some great news! What? That you didn't wear those shoes all day long? <laughs> Mom, that's mean. No, it. That's a shame. I pulled some strings with a client. And I got Zoe a fellowship at Teen Vogue. Oh, oh my God! Wait, <laughs> hey! Sorry, Mom, it's Teen Vogue. Mm. I was gonna find a way out of your gross internship anyway. Hey, we mine's gross too. All right, you're starting in the mailroom. Rock bottom. <laughs> Still better than the top of the hospital. Ah! <laughs> there you go. Bye. Oh, did, uh, did you go out in that? Yes, I did. Mm. What? Okay. Welcome to A World Bill. Can we please make some noise for Yara Shahidi, please? Hi. How does this feel? This feels so cool. I love the energy in here. It's amazing that you're not exhausted, though, because no. you've been moving nonstop. <laughs> It has been a little crazy, but you know, I capture great energy in this little chakra necklace of mine, so uh, I'm just gonna like save this, and it'll keep me going for the week. It seems like you're a very like spiritual person, and this is something yeah. that comes from your mother as well. Like, mm -hmm. So you meditate? Uh, I try to, it's something that I have to get better at. I'm, I, the thing is, my meditation usually turns into just sleep, <laughs> and so. It's not just you, it's pretty much everybody. Yeah, yeah okay, like, I, feel, I, I feel a little better that I'm not alone in that. So usually I just go to sleep. Yeah, it's like something you try to do every single day, knowing that it works for you, but the sleep just feels so much better. It does. How does, like, you know, you keep yourself positive, and I know there was something about affirmations and then kind of taping them up on your wall and constantly seeing these things, kind of getting your brain and your mind and your soul ready for this, all this. I know. I mean, I feel like what's been nice about just kind of how my family has raised me is that uh, we've been able to take a moment with every fantastic thing that happens to just appreciate it and appreciate the abundance that comes into our house. And so that means that we do, like, we are a family of affirmations. The amount of things that I have on my wall is insane. And it ranges from a picture of Kendrick Lamar reading The Bluest Eye to, like, um, one of my favorite uh, notes I had gotten from a teacher of mine. And I feel like it's just important to surround yourself or allow your house or your home or wherever you're staying to be a sanctuary for you to feel uh, as though you're taking care of yourself. So it's almost like a vision board and such. Yes, and we are big vision boarding families. Do you update your vision board? Definitely. I mean, I feel like my vision board when I was seven is so different than what it is now. <laughs> well, you had one at seven, though. Oh, yeah. I feel like most people get a vision board when they read The Secret. They're like, oh, I need to change my life. But I read The Secret been... at seven. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in and out since then. Yeah. What was your latest addition to the vision board? Um, I'm trying to think. Okay, I feel like it was... Whew. Oh, college. Um, yes. I, I recently got into college. Uh, fortunately, I can say I got into every college I applied to. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and so with that, you should have seen my room when the, uh, when the acceptances came out. I had every candle burning. I had... Wait, you like, were nervous? So, oh, yeah. Because I feel like what I realized, I was talking about this on the way here, um, acting has been amazing, and I love every moment of it. But it wasn't something I planned for. College is something I have been planning for for such a long time. Like, I have wanted to go to college before I was in middle school. And so I think because of that, that's what made this just such an insanely cool moment and also nerve wracking because it was like, I've been leading up to this. This is, for me, I was like, this is 12 academic years in the making. So would you say that this was a bigger uh, set of nerves than all the, doing the modeling, the acting, <laughs> it was getting into college. I think it was like, okay, Emmys were cool. College apps, even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you took your time in writing those in and sending those. Oh, yeah, oh my goodness, the amount of time that went into those. I feel like what was funny is because we were shooting all year, basically, it was Christmas break, me and my mama on the couch, like, okay, so this is the list of what I have to do. This is a list of what's yet to be done. Um, okay, I have an essay. There was one essay that was due at 11.59 p.m. I turned it in at 11.57 p.m. And nice. I was like, Wi-Fi, pull through, please. <laughs> <laughs> I need to turn this in. You're ready for college already. 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I think I need to stretch, then I'll be good. So do you have an idea of what school you would like to go to? Um, I, I do. I'm keeping that a little close to the vest right now. But this is what I will say. I got into an HB, one very specific HBCU, two state schools, and uh, four Ivy Leagues. Nice, yeah. nice. So what is, yeah, please, that deserves some applause. What is the criteria for you deciding which school? So I know you're double majoring in African American studies and sociology. Great memory. So what are you, what, are the, what is the criteria? Is it meal plan? What is it? Uh, well, I feel like I'm going to have to blue apron it wherever I go anyway, <laughs> because my father has made a very picky eater out of me. But anyway, I would have to say that like in this process of even looking at the schools, it's been really paying attention to what professors that I want to learn under, um, the students there. I feel like at every school that I went to and toured, what was really specific about the schools that I applied to was that every student was really encouraged to be multifaceted. Now, I'm not saying that not every school encourages that, but I feel like um, I had the opportunity to meet students who were like, I want to be in fashion, but I'm studying English and history and yeah. doing all of these amazing things. And I feel like just that uh, multi like multifacetedness that's encouraged at schools is what I'm looking for as somebody who is a creative but also an academic. I feel like it's, uh, I've been looking for a space in which I can feel fulfilled in all areas. So why sociology? Because if you do your research, we know that you're very woke. <laughs> Thank so we, you. I, I, we'll put African American studies to the side for a brief second, but why sociology? Um, well, I've always wanted to study history. I've been obsessed with history since before I could remember, and it started with like a love of Greek mythology, and it just changed from there. And uh, when I was just starting to think about the college process, I kept changing what I wanted to major in. I was like, okay, um, history, um, okay, creative advertisement, no, criminology, I can go to Quantico. No, is it easier to just become a criminal? Um, <laughs> like, a whole list of things. And so, or you can play one on TV. You know? yeah, yeah, I think I was a little too inspired by uh, White Collar and some other shows <laughs> I watched at the time. But um, I'd have to say I ended up on sociology partly because I view it as active history. And I think what I was missing in history is the action step and the fact that we learn about what happens in our world, but it doesn't feel as though uh, you are then pushed to do something. You memorize dates and times and places, and what I realized, what I loved the most was the fact that I wanted to know why something happened, and I feel like sociology is what answers that. Um, since I realized from a, a fairly, fairly early on that history seems so circular, and what changes are our circumstances and our technological advancement and our societal advancement, but a lot of the um, situations that happen are very similar. And I think just realizing that, it was like, okay, no, it's not about memorizing when this happened, but why this happened. And I felt as though sociology was were the answers to so many of my questions. And as somebody who wants to go into what I call professional activism, yeah. I feel like it's a great starting off place for starting point for whatever I end up doing. And kind of combining African-American studies because mm -hmm. while history is so circular, it is also written by certain people in different ways. Yeah. So I guess combining the two, talk about how you believe that you could take this into professional activism. Well, I feel like the sociology combination, I, I do have to reference the fact that the amazing uh, Michelle Obama studied sociology. Yes, yeah. And so I feel like if that's not inspiration enough to do anything, I don't know what is. But um, I think there's that aspect, and so many people that study sociology then go into law or social justice or are prepared to then take a federal position. And so not only was it doing research and figuring out what uh, sociology may a sociology major allows you to do, but then combining it with African American studies, I think just um, so many times our history is not included in mainstream history. And I mean, it's not anything new or anything surprising, but I felt as though I wanted to make sure that I took the time and had the major that supplemented whatever I was missing in sociology and did really count for my experience, the experience of my community, because ultimately that's what I'm trying to then go help be a liaison for when I then go into the world. It seems like you're taking this into every single facet of everything else you're doing, even in your modeling as well. Mm -hmm. Did some work for Ivy Park. Yeah. Right? And now you're just starting to deal with uh, women management, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? So crisscrossing the globe while still being awoke, <laughs> you know, still being awake, like, you know, it just seems so powerful to see a young black woman. I can't lie to you. Thank you. Yeah, can we please clap it up for that, please? Like, yeah. Thank 
you. Um, and we touched on Michelle Obama, um, and she and another special person, your AP Cal teacher, wrote your uh, <laughs> recommendation. Yes, and guess what? I found out. My AP Cal teacher only wrote my letter of recommendation. Really? She emailed me, yes. <laughs> I feel really special right now. The fact that you took AP Calc 1 <laughs> and 2, got a letter of recommendation out of her is amazing. I know. I think when she said that, I was like, wait, it was only me? Because there are quite a few people that take it at my school. So I was like, you don't understand how special I felt when she told me that. That was a moment where I was like, oh, my goodness, that work was worth it. It's always worth it. Yes. And so Zoe, it's kind of ironic how Zoe's kind of at that same position in her mm -hmm. life, too, like choosing colleges and stuff. And now you got a spinoff. I know, that's that's kind of crazy. So let's see what happens with that. Yeah. But um, Just recently shot the pilot. Yeah, and talk, I let's think... Talk, tell us all, D, dish, dish. Dish, okay. Well, I'm going to dish with the parameters of what the ABC Guardians put on me. So <laughs> I'm going to say She's this. She's papered up. She's papered up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do have to say that tonight's episode, you actually get to see where Zoe gets into school, which is really exciting. I just watched it, I think, right before our flight when I should have been packing. So I do not have any toothpaste with me on this trip I had to buy some but I did watch the episode um so on the like when we finally address Zoe going to school what's really cool about it is that it's a new environment it's completely brand new and I feel like um, while Zoe has taken so many steps as a young woman and a young woman of color uh, uh, to become an independent and to become an activist and to become socially aware I think this is the most growth we've seen from her just in that she has lived under the guise of a family household. You really don't see her at school, or you don't see her with friends, and you don't see her in many situations in which you can say for certain, I guess, that um, she is becoming socially aware or coming into her own. And so being in college, she is no longer in an environment that's even slightly familiar. And I think what's most important about it, or one thing that I had noticed just in reading the script, is that she has, I mean, while she is a young black girl in this political climate, she does have the privilege of being socioeconomically well off, in which case college, you don't see that. College, um, at least for Zoe, that is no longer a factor that she can hide under or hide with. And so we're no longer talking about race, but the intersection of race and gender and sexuality and the intersection of race and politics. And she finally has to kind of deal on her own. And so I feel like it's, it's going to be a cool process of watching her grow and seeing how she operates. I feel like what's most inspiring for me is seeing the fact that Zoe does have a voice and opinion. And while we, of course, have seen it from her throughout the yeah. seasons, yeah. this is a particularly special episode. One thing I think about that Blackish does so well is it still tells the black experience and it keeps it at the mm -hmm. forefront, but let's be frank, it makes it palatable to white audiences and non-black mm -hmm. audiences. Are you excited to take this same idea, the same rubric, and to take it to college? Definitely. Oh, I just hit my tooth with a mic. <laughs> kind of hurt. <laughs> um, but I was a little too, I was a little too overzealous about that <laughs> answer. Um, I'd be excited too if I had my own spinoff. <laughs> yeah. But um, I definitely am, especially because we're coming in with the same great team of Blackish. And what I love so much is it's not necessarily um, something so independent that you'll never see her on Blackish again, but we're going to see the fa the, that crossover. And we're going to see, like, she's always going to be a part of that family. And the fact that we're able to take what's happening on college campuses around the nation right now and address it is a really special thing because so many times, especially given what's happened since November 8th oh, on. Yes. Um, We're learning Russian every day. Oh, yeah. And I mean, my aunt is a professor and even watching what she has to deal with as a professor and as the head of her department uh, as it pertains to making sure every student feels comfortable, no matter whether they agree or disagree with what she believes in. I think it's added another element to the college experience that we haven't seen in a while. And so the fact that we can address that and address not only... I guess what's happening culturally and uh, socially, but address what's happening politically and address it from a point of view of a young person who hasn't had this experience before. Unlike Pops or Dre or any other character, this is all brand new. While everybody else can say, well, because this happened to me as a kid, this is how I deal with it, she hasn't had really any background experience other than the theoretical guidance of her parents and her grandparents. So talk about how, uh, on the show, how you differ from Zoe politically, like your views politically. Um, I would have to say 
Fortunately, Zoe and I agree on most things when she does take a stance. I feel like what I've noticed from Zoe, and it's not necessarily a bad quality, but it's just a difference that we have, is that she takes a more apolitical stance to things. And so while I may be like, okay, let's donate to the ACLU, what can we do? What policy can we change? Even in the Lemons episode in which we were discussing the election, her point was that she was she wanted to come from a place of love and she wanted to make sure that she could help start the conversation that connected both sides rather than taking a political stance per se. And so in that case, I feel as though her apolitical stance um, is beneficial, but it's not necessarily something that we both do. Yes. I, I do appreciate her sentiment, definitely, and I feel like coming from a place of love is a given. Mm -hmm. But then I think there is that action step that I like to take. And I mean, I'm happy to say that you're going to see her take that action step. You're going to see the fact that she realizes that, of course, she has this great foundation and the yeah. apolitical space of wanting to come from everybody is human and everybody deserves to be treated equally is a fantastic foundation to then grow and become socially aware or involved. But now now we get to see the actual involvement. The actual action step. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's the one thing I think is really awesome, especially in the way you speak about your activism and pol pol politics, is that you're anti-policy, not necessarily anti-Trump. Yeah. I mean, a, that's a tough. That's a tough statement. I think partly because this administration, I feel like the policies that have been changing um, do personally affect my family. And they hit you very close to home. Yeah, I mean, even, and I know I am one of many, many people whose families were affected by the travel ban. Mm -hmm. And even having to be cognizant of the fact that your family may not be able to come visit you. Yeah. Or leave, or be trapped in an airport. Fortunately, I didn't have any members, that, uh, any family members that were trapped in an airport or in any dire circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it made me hyper aware of what people are going through, where it's like, if I am affected and I still do not have anybody that was personally affected by this. I know that people are going through this on 10 times worse than I am. And so I guess I, I try and come from a place of, I am disagreeing with people, but also understanding that my, my anger is negative energy and is not yeah. active or is not progressive. And so as, as angry or frustrated as I can be at this administration, I'm not trying to excuse them of anything. Yes. But I realized that it was important for me to be in spaces like this and in other positive spaces so that I could take this anger and recirculate it. So I felt as though I was actually doing something to counter to counter what's happening. When that executive order was signed and you saw the outpouring of support mm -hmm. and the shutting down of the airports, how did it make you feel to see this actual progressive action taking place? Um, very hopeful and I feel like just being a part of this generation has been such a gift because social activism is such a given with myself and my peers that I think it's no longer I, as um, as much of a choice anymore, but just so ingrained in who we are as this generation to be socially aware, to be socially inclined, active, involved, um, that I can say, I can comfortably say to my peers, like, what are we gonna do about this? And the fact that there's so many things that are happening right now in which people are uniting together to make this political change is, I mean, I'm definitely hopeful because of it. And I think it just speaks to the fact that right now, I believe what we're witnessing is the amalgamation of all great movements, just mm -hmm. this idea that because of what's happening has affected so many communities on such a personal level, it is no longer this divided movement, but understanding finally the fact that, uh, the fact that if we make sure that black lives matter, it validates that every other life matters, matters as, as well. well. There's like an implied two yes. after the black lives matter. And then I think just with that realization, it's no longer about the nitpicking of each movement, but rather the joining of them and realizing that we have to help one another to get to where we want to be. Yes, yes, so, we can clap it up for that yeah. too. Thank you. And there is a term for that. Intersectionality. Yes. The beauty of intersectionality. Oh my goodness. I just heard Angela Davis speak. Go. I, I don't mean to brag, <laughs> but you know, I have not washed my chakra necklace since because I was like, <laughs> I'm going to hold on to this. Um, no, I was here, I heard her speak at the Underground Museum. If anyone's in LA, you have to go. 
have to go to the underground. Anyway, I heard her speak and it was one of the most incredible things ever because she was discussing intersectionality. And I feel like so many times because there is this idea that whatever community you're a part of, there's some monolithic experience, we don't even understand that so many times people have to live this intersection of lives that we don't go through at all. I think while we feel as though, while some people may feel as though transgender rights are different from rights for uh, people of color or the global majority is a term that I knew I now like to use, but um, like global I, majority, I love. Yeah, that. I'm I, sorry, I'm I sorry, listened to it on a radio show yeah. the other day, and I was just like, yes, I like that <laughs> it word. Makes a ton of sense. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, I think then it's kind of ignoring the fact that there are pe there are people of color who are transgender who are dealing with this, and the fact that we have to account for identity is not just ethnicity or sexuality or gender. They're not separate entities, but they're so ingrained in one another that if you do not help the progression of all identities or all aspects of identities, then in many ways, no one is able to live a full experience. Yes, and there's also this idea of you have to um, legislate and bring up from the bottom of the social totem pole, which mm -hmm. I guess would be black trans women. And if you help them rise up, then it brings everybody up around that. Yeah, I mean, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yes. But I, I think it is definitely something that's inspiring to see in which education has now t been at the forefront of this movement. This idea that I know I don't know everything and I know that as somebody who is speaking publicly that it is important for me to acquire new information and to feel as though I am coming from a place in which I am equipped to talk about whatever I'm going to talk about that day. But to be in a place in which we can help educate one another is a, it's a special space because we're no longer saying we expect you to know everything as an activist yes. and that there are no longer these stringent qualifications for activism. Rather, it's this idea that activism comes from a place of helping ed to el educate and willing to be educated. But it still keeps you on your P's, it's like on your, on your, on your, uh, uh, on your toes though mm -hmm. because you still get this immediate feedback so you mm -hmm. want to make sure you are speaking correctly are up to date. Yeah, and there are definitely times in which I learn just how careful you have to be with your words. But also, I, I think part of that is because of this, this time that we're living in, it's necessary to pay attention to what you're saying. I think we no longer have the ability to just say whatever and feel as though it has no repercussions, partly because everything is amplified from social media, which is both it can both be uh, a very critical place to be, but it's a fantastic space to live in if you embrace it, because it is a point in which you know how to then you know, like, once you make a mistake, people will correct you. And then it's like, okay, note taken. It's like, my bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I think as long as we come from that space of constructive conversation, then it no longer feels like this, everything I'm doing is on trial, but rather everything that I'm doing, people are really listening to it and either have honest support or honest feedback, in which I will take both. So let's take some feedback in the form of questions from the audience. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Introduce yourself. Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm good. We're Insta friends, just yeah. FYI. <laughs> full disclosure, full yeah. disclosure. It's so great to finally see you in person. Like, <laughs> Likewise. It feels like it's been a while. Um, so I constantly tell you how proud I am of you and how amazing Thank you are, you. how much you inspire me, along with all the other amazing women. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Whoa, You're I like just somewhere read here. your shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so anyway, well, question. Um, so what is a piece, what is a lesson that someone taught you that has always stayed with you? And what is a lesson you hope to teach others? Ha, huh. that's an interesting one. I feel like I, I say this, but it's going to sound cliche because I feel like everybody hears this at one point in their life or multiple points or every day. It's like, be yourself. And I think it, it's very theoretical advice where it's like, okay, that's great, but what if policy doesn't allow me to be myself? Or what if uh, it's not socially acceptable to be quote unquote myself? Um, I think because of this advice that I've gotten, just the importance of maintaining a sense of self, I think if anything, that's motivated my activism as well because it then makes me hyper aware of when there are restrictions on one's identity. And I feel like just in that, in that search for self, you also have to search for a space to be yourself. And if there is no space, then you have to create that space. So I think that has been uh, fantastic advice because it's really covered all areas of life too, from acting in which you're literally paid to be somebody other than yourself, um, to policy, to school, I think just, 
this idea of maintaining um, who you are. And also the idea, I feel like one other thing that I always stress and I guess a lesson that I like to share is the fact that your sense of self will change over time and that change is scary and oftentimes it seems as though like, why am I changing right now? I'm a, I'm a 17 year old girl. I'm like, what is happening to me right now? It's happening um, so fast. Yeah, it's like this change is happening really fast. And so I think it's just this idea of making sure that you stay, I, I feel like while society is trying to create space finally for this fluidity, making sure that we have a space within ourselves to accept that about ourselves and the fact that we are ever changing and ever growing and ever evolving yeah and, and by the way i love your shirt yes it's, it's free it's, it's so fantastic. cool it's like the bit says be bold like yara so beautiful we have another question hi yara hi thank you so much for being here my pleasure i had the opportunity to listen to your young your essence young hollywood speech oh yeah and it was incredibly moving my question thank is you. uh what has your character zoe taught you about your own blackness, and do you ever feel that you need to conform, or you've been challenged to conform to the industry's beauty standards? Um, okay, so answering the first part of what yeah. Zoe has taught me, I feel like Zoe and being on a project like Blackish finally gave me a term to describe myself, just because I know a lot of people were like, what in the world does blackish mean when the billboards went up everywhere and no one knew what was happening? <laughs> there was no explanation, just blackish. <laughs> um, and while it could have been off putting at first, I realized just in being on a show like blackish, being somebody that is half black and half Iranian and proud of both sides, it gave me a community of people that identify as blackish because so many times, um, if you are of any race, there is a certain almost feeling whether people put this on you or you put this on yourself, this meter <laughs> of like, how black am I, how Iranian am I? And it's, it's hard when you're both to feel as though you can coexist as both and be fully both. And so I think being blackish was the perfect word because it described both the fact that I can be biracial and proud of my heritage on both sides, as well as accepting the fact that we live in a point in time in which a lot of my behaviors or a lot of the culture that I consume is an amalgamation of so many other people's cultures. And so there is that ish on the end to represent every other thing that I'm intaking from the people in the world around me. And then when it comes to the beauty standards of Hollywood, um, fortunately, I've been protected by my team, by my mother, by my parents, just to not feel that kind of pressure. And I think part of that comes with being so specific with what roles I would even audition for. Just because I think more than beauty standards, there's just a standard of being. <laughs> and so more than what you are supposed to look like, it's what you're supposed to act like. And I think that can be a little more intimidating. Uh, just because I think just being an actor and coming from this space of wanting to be a creative and wanting to live and take whatever creative, cool, juicy role you get is it can be disheartening when it's like, oh, okay, I've seen 10 character descriptions with the word urban. I mean, I got a script in which one, one character just kind of talked in hashtags. And I was like, what, huh? <laughs> <sighs> Hashtag what? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, think, I, I think because of just, um, just being so specific with what I ended up even choosing to pursue, it's protected me from that feeling of conformity or that feeling of needing to uh, needing to fit in. And I mean, even with Zoe, we've been on such a journey with her and that growth has been so intentional because I realized like it is, she is an intersection of multiple identities like we were talking about. Not only is she a young woman of color, but she represents her generation as well. And so I think there is easily a stereotype placed on like ages and just what it means to be a teenager and what it means to be a, like, I think so many times um, social unawareness is even promoted in what we see in which we live in a bubble that is not broken <laughs> until we reach adulthood and I feel like for so many of my peers that's not our truth and so to be on a journey in which I may not agree with what Zoe does but at least we see this multifaceted aspect of her in which she can be completely self-involved for one episode and then the next episode you see she's taken one for the team because that's what she cares about she cares about her family she cares about her school and her society 
and then she's back to taking selfies. And I like the fact that she can go from both extremes or she can be right in the middle too. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Yeah. Such range. And we have one more. Yeah. Hi. Hi, how are you? Aaron? Good. I wanted to ask you, um, it's hard to talk to you because you you all only see Koopa and Mapada. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I wanted to ask friends. you, how amazing was it to not only meet Michelle Obama, but to sit and talk with her and then find out in the aftermath that she actually wrote a letter of acceptance for you? Um, well, I'd have to say just in meeting her, I call this the, the Obama effect. It doesn't matter if you have just met them or you know them for if you've known them for the past year or eight years or for a lifetime. It, like when I met them for the first time, it felt like I knew them for 35 years and I was only 14. <laughs> and so I think it's just some, like the presence that they have for people that not only were, are the figureheads of our society and had to take so much heat from the world around them, they have this like unimaginable presence in which they have met hundreds of people before me and there are hundreds of people after me waiting to meet them and yet it feels as though they invited us personally to be there and I think that, that that just comes from just being so tapped in that you can do that and that's something that I aspire to have. Um, I feel like talking to her, I feel like uh, when, when I did that panel with her, uh, every other second I was just kind of looking over like she's still there. <laughs> Whoa. They haven't whisked her away. <laughs> yeah, that's not a stand-in. Like, that's actually her. I was waiting to turn around and realize that it was like a stunt double or something, but it was, it was her. And I feel like part of that comes from the fact that, I mean, they've centered, I think, I, I feel so honored to be, say that I've been able to work with them and work um, within some of their initiatives that they have launched during the administration, and that will surely last outside of the administration. But... Um, because I feel um, that they took so much time to give back to the community and took so much time to really make the White House a space for all people, it's surreal to be around people that not only have this great title, but really have redefined what it means to have that title. Yeah. I, I guess a little fun tidbit, while they were in office, my goal was to be the first third wheel like to just kind of fo professionally follow them. You know, like whenever you see them in, in the Oval Office, I'd kind of be under the desk, like, hey guys, I'm here. And you know, I haven't given up on that dream. <laughs> That's why I'm going to study sociology and African American studies. I'm just trying to get like a great resume so I can file for the Obama Foundation as the first third wheel. It's happening, 2035. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, so before we get out of here, you have a really strong family and everybody's working, moving and shaking and doing their own things. But what's the feeling when you still go home and they look across the table and you're still Yara? Oh, Saeed. I'm all warm inside to make me think about my family. Okay, well, I guess a little background. We first met because we were doing yeah. something for HuffPost for Mother's Day and it was me and my mama. And it was probably one of my favorite experiences ever. Um, it was but, amazing watch it. You guys are like <laughs> twins. It's, it's absolutely we insane. are a little bit. <laughs> but um, I, I think what's so fantastic is um, the foundation that my parents have set at home. Because as actors, I think there's this idea that there has to be some sort of competition in which that was eliminated from the get-go, partly because of just this idea or this belief that we had that what's meant for us is meant for us. It doesn't mean that we don't try hard for the other opportunities, but what we end up, what ends up coming to us is because it should come to us. And so that meant that just as a family with three children actors, we always support each other. I was... I'm always on set when Saeed's shooting a new project or when Esan is up to something, and they're always on set. Now, given Esan is usually only there for the snacks, but he's also there for me. <laughs> and the ice cream sandwiches. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The ice cream sandwiches, too. He only comes on Fridays when there's <laughs> sugar. But, um, but, you know, I think because of the fact that we are so supportive of one another, it's yeah. made our home experience amazing. And like, I think what's so cool about it is just like getting to that point in our, in our 
like sibling relationship too, in which it, it's so it's so much more than just the whole acting commonality. But I realize that like me and my middle brother Saeed are kind of the same person. Mm -hmm. It's really funny if you have the two of us in a room. We have an unspoken language, is what my mother likes to call it, because I'll just look at him and then I start crying from laughter because he, we have some sort of inside like telepathy joke. Telepathy or something. Oh, yeah, it's real. He's inspired me to be an X-Men because <laughs> I obviously have telepathy. Um, and with my younger brother, he has just this, this charisma. I feel like he's going to be CEO of the world soon, and I'm so here for it. He's like set um, up, though, because he's sitting there watching you all move. Oh, and, and he is so perceptive. He's the kind of person, I was walking, I was leaving for work one day, and he was, I was like, what are you watching us on? He was like, House Hunters, I wanted to know, like, the, the price per square foot. <laughs> <laughs> You're eight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he also is, like, he, for us, is our acting coach. He charges us $25 a week to run lines with him. <laughs> and Wow. I remember one episode of Black, and she was like, Yara, you were a little flat. I only love oh. <laughs> But I so appreciate it, too. And I feel like that's the kind of relationship we have. We keep it so real with one another that yeah. it's, like, the best thing to come home. He was just in Esan. The littlest one was in Florida for the week with uh, one of my grandparents. And him coming back, I was like, finally! <laughs> <laughs> I missed you. And that's, and that's me with Saeed, too. He's like, Yara, I've been gone for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> There's a funny story your mother had told us about when uh, Esan first met Jay-Z and Beyonce. Oh my God. Can yeah. you tell us that? Oh, yeah. Okay, so it was a rainy day. Ooh. <laughs> Setting the scenery. Right? Yeah, the air was crisp. We were in Washington, D.C. We had just met the Obamas for the first time at what I'm calling the last Easter egg roll. <laughs> but, well, the last uh, one worth going to. Yes. Yeah. But um, we had just met them. I was on, like, it's the equivalent of a sugar high that doesn't end. <laughs> um, but... So we go into this tent, and I was there because my friends Chloe and Hallie are two amazing singers. I love them. And, of course, they're signed to Parkwood. And I was like, oh, they're in this tent. I want to see them before they go perform. And then I happen in this tent, and it's like, oh, there's also, Beyonce is also here with Jay-Z. Okay. No biggie. No, no biggie. biggie. I'm just going to play it cool. Obviously, I'm great at that. <laughs> But um, <laughs> then, so I bring my brother in with me. And so uh, I introduce myself, and they're amazing people. And so he shakes Beyonce's hand, shakes Jay-Z's hand. He goes, Yara, I heard Jay-Z was here. I was like, <laughs> you just met him. He's like, no, 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 no. What? He's like, no, he's here somewhere. Will you help me find him? I was like, Asan, he's right here. You just took a picture with him, dude. And so he ends up running around this tent looking for Jay-Z. <laughs> what we end up figuring out is the fact that because he's only seen pictures of Jay-Z's album cover, he only knows what this part of his face <laughs> looks like. <laughs> the rest is covered by a hat. <laughs> so, you know... Couldn't be mad, but once he figured that out, I I went I left the tent and then I'm like, where's Esan? He's in there taking a selfie, just him and Jay Z. <laughs> it's only, but I think because he was so short, Esan has a tendency of taking pictures with people that he loves, but he only gets himself in frame because. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just Jay Z's chin. <laughs> I mean, that's all he knows. That's all he can recognize, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all he recognizes anyway. Yara, thank you so much. Yeah, thank can you please you. make some noise for Yara Shahidi. <laughs>